Good afternoon, everyone. I'm Anthony Painter. I'm Chief Research and Impact Officer at the RSA, and I'd like to welcome you all to today's RSA online event. Um, I'm delighted to have the chance to talk today to John Hawkins. John is a leading figure in a global understanding of work and creativity. He's written extensively on it. Uh, he's a former chair of Createch and London Film School. He was chief advisor to HBO and Time Warner for 15 years and many, many other things besides. Um, his latest book, Invisible Work, is an exploration of the changing nature of work and the importance of unique human faculties in preparing us for the future. John, thank you very much for joining us. Good to talk with you. Uh, John, I, I just want to take a step back before we get into the book, if that's okay. And, and you know, you, you have done and do a lot of work in China, Europe, the United States, obviously you're, you're UK based also. And as we look at the sort of unfolding crisis around us and um, with COVID-19, what are your sort of reflections on how these different societies are responding in different ways? I think that's a really interesting question. And I think the way in which China and Asia and the rest of the world are responding are different. And I think that's been clear over the last few months. And I think it's going to affect our attitude toward China and, and, and the rest of the world um, after this crisis is over. After, after fumbling uh, uh, for, uh, for a few weeks, China, as you know, moved incredibly swiftly. They locked down Wuhan, they locked down all of Hubei, about 50, 60 million people. And they seem to have nipped the epidemic in the bud. And what was known as well, so me talking to people in China, uh, not on a daily basis, but almost weekly with, with people in Shanghai, Chengdu, Beijing and elsewhere, was that they accepted that. that they thought that was a good idea. And um, they went along with it. And they're still going along with it. And, Whereas the countries in Europe, um, uh, democracies, representative democracies, in one way or another, were slow to pick up about what was happening in China and, and really slow to react, really slow. And I think there was a moment about, uh, let's say, the beginning of March when societies, individuals were saying to their governments, please do something about it. So in a way, you could say the Chinese government acted in advance of what the public was expecting and wanting. And governments in Europe, particularly the UK government, which was really slow, acted more slowly than we wanted. We, we wanted them to act, they were too slow about it. It's so interesting, isn't it? And and you know, we've been obviously observing and 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 part of this. And you know, you you look at sort of European democracies and European societies. It, it seems to have almost been, at a governance level anyway, a, a degree of complacency. Almost it sort of it couldn't happen here type attitude. You know, SARS and swine flu and what have what have you tended to sort of emerge in in in, in Asia. And we tended not to have that experience over the last um, 19, 20 years or so. Um, and, and weirdly, so the people, a lot of sort of the people were screaming for more action, while yeah. another portion of people were just sort of saying, have, were sort of imbued with the same sense of complacency. And we're, we're reading a lot around our, our different societies in this context. I think that's right. Well, I think there are two things, there are two contributive factors to the, to the UK response. Um, but but it, it's not just the UK, but, but the UK was an egregious situation. One was the, the a sort of disregard for expertise. Um, public health expertise is, is not a high profile activity. And I think the UK government tended to ignore expertise in general, and they ignored public health expertise in particular. I think also there's been a withdrawal amongst populist governments like we have in the UK and the US. Um, to, to go it alone um, a, a, and to ignore international organizations. And there was, there was a period of three or four weeks when the US, the UK were really being critical of the World Health Organization and other international organizations and also international professional academic networks that were saying, look, we know what's happening and it's up to you to take action. So there was a sort of there has been over the last two decades, it's all withdrawal away from expertise and a deliberate attempt to withdraw from international organizations. And those have made us more vulnerable. 
And you get a double whammy, don't you, really, where um, sort of international expertise is almost doubly disregarded in these contexts, not least from China. And of course, what was happening is um, our on the ground epidemiologists, and so on and so forth were working out what was going on with the, the emergence of this, this new virus. They were they were reporting it, they were um, scientifically assessing, and they were translating all this into English, um, I hasten to add. It's obviously was really picking up by WHO and others. Um, it doesn't seem to have been picked up in, in what seems to have been quite a sort of parochial culture in a number of, of European nations, you know, the UK included. I think that's true. I think international expertise is, is it's hard to get a foot into Downing Street if, if you come saying, I'm not British I, and I'm an expert. That, that, that's not going to get you a hearing. And, and I think that's a, that's a fundamental shift in the attitude we have had in the UK. And I think it really goes back, it, it goes back almost to Harold Wilson and, and, and Thatcher. And it, it's not left or right. Um, evidence-based policymaking where you did have governments that listened to the experts, whether they were individual experts, academics, things like very well, and, and they would feed into the policymaking process. And there's been an abrupt change in the US and the UK, uh, linked very much to the ascendancy of Trump and the ascendancy of Boris Johnson. And what's also I've, I've noticed over the last few months is a lot of the expertise about public health and, and the coronavirus has come from all over the world. I mean, you know, it is absolutely not in any one country. It's, it's a very, the, the data gathering, the data analysis, the, the infographics that are being produced, which are outstanding, are coming from anywhere. There's one in particular I follow coming out of Poland. The, 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 the range of data there is amazing. But as I say, it doesn't get a foot in the door of the major policymakers and decision makers in the national governments. So what's interesting, of course, you know, starting to move towards um, the notion of invisible work is much of this expertise actually is, is sort of old school observation, number crunching, analysis, modelling, um, sort of peer review uh, and, and oversight linked to you know, old sort of public administration models of, of, of policy development and so on. Um, and in, in your book, you describe a number of, of circles of activity. The first is sort of moving materials and, and the second is sort of um, management. And actually, um, you know, before we get onto the concept of invisible work, I'll be rediscovering the virtue of sort of that, that, that management circle, that management of information in quite a methodical and meticulous way. Um, or is there something underneath this is just hinting in a more sort of invisible work style direction? I, I use the word management a lot. I, I do so always rather nervously. Um, because it, it, has, it has a good reputation and a bad reputation, both together. I don't talk a lot about managers. I talk about managing. And I think what, what happens with, it, with invisible work, and particularly now, it's happening in every household in the country as people are forced more to work at home. Not everybody, but a lot of people. They have to manage their own work. They have to what I call step up and manage their own work. And I think I follow Peter Drucker on this. The, the three levels of management. First of all, you've got to manage yourself. If you don't manage yourself, you can't manage anybody else. You've got to manage yourself. The second thing you've got to manage for the organization. You've got to do something that helps the organization, not just enjoy yourself or have fun thinking your thoughts, but work for the organization. And thirdly, you have to do that in a way that benefits society. I think those three principles, Peter Drucker's principles of management, are really important and are being thrown into relief now as more and more people question what it is that they, what their work consists of and how they can best do it and also why they're doing it. What gives them pleasure out of their work and how they articulate their work to other people when those people are not sitting next door to them or around the table in a meeting room, 
but are somewhere else. They may not know exactly where, and they're not quite certain how to contact them. Is it, is it voice? Is it, is it an email? Is it a video link? How often should we do that? What is, how do we manage these communications issues? So we've been forced more and more to ask what it is that we, everybody's being asked more and more what it is that they think they're doing when they're working. So interesting. And, and we'll, let's come on to this question of sort of um, uh, self management and purpose in a moment. But I think probably for the, the, the benefit of the audience, do you want to just give us a quick definition of invisible work, just so we're clear we know what we're, we're talking about? Yes, it's, it's the work that's going on in our heads, um, sort of all the time. Um, and it's, it's, very, it's very private, it's personal, it, it's subjective, it's a matter of opinion. Um, because it's going on in our heads, um, it's nomadic. We, can, we can't do all of it anywhere, but we can do a lot of it wherever we are. And it's also never ending. We can have ideas at, at any moment, regardless of whether we're in an office or indeed regardless of whether we're working, we think we're working or not. Um, and I, I first came across it really and was puzzled by it when I was working in an open plan office. And I was looking around the 20, 25 people who were there. And I realized one day that I had no idea whether they were actually working or not. And if they were working, let's assume they were, and it was a good company, it was a successful company, and I knew a lot of them very well, and I, I'd hired some of them. I had no idea whether at that moment their work was going well or badly. I, I couldn't gauge whether they wanted to be left alone or, or, or wanted to wanted help in some, in some way. So I, I began to realize there's something going on here that we don't often talk about. And at, at one level, what I'm saying is that, that cognitive work, but, but it's also quite emotional, it's not just pure cognition, um, is invisible. And, you know, that's, that's, that's something we, we know that. But it occurred to me that when we talk about jobs and work, um, management, teamwork, pay, how we pay people, how we reward people, we don't acknowledge enough that the heart of their work is invisible. So I realized there was something going on there that was really important, but we weren't paying enough attention to it. It's so interesting. And, and, and how, I mean, the, the danger, of course, is once you start to focus on these invisible processes, cognitive and emotional, so and creative, um, in some respects, um, the, the danger is you start gravitating towards a sort of creative class or a class of knowledge workers. And of course, there's a very deep danger there, um, isn't there? Especially, again, you you know, I hate to sort of keep on drawing us back to the current moment, but uh, much of the work um, that is of greatest value beyond the science and analysis is the emotional labour of care, of persistence, of resilience that we see in the NHS, in local authorities, even those people who are sort of, you know, distributing our food and manufacturing and packaging our food in this, in, in this urgent time. And actually, it's not the, the, the physical act itself or the organizational act. It's that ability to have that wider purpose, commitment, perseverance, resilience, care in these moments. Does that have a place within this sort of broad concept of invisible work? Absolutely. Because, again, I emphasize work, not a job. And, and there, there are very few work, kinds of work, very few processes that are 100% invisible. Uh, and, and likewise, there are very few that are 100% um, invisible. So we are a mix of visible and invisible. And I, I think we should not make the same distinction between, um, or, or a hard and fast distinction between visible and invisible, as increasingly we have learned not to make a hard and fast distinction between creative and non-creative. The, the, the creativity started with the creative industries, and then we sort of began to realize that actually a lot of jobs were, were creative. You know, they weren't 100% they were, um, creative, but there was a creative within it. And I'm saying that also for invisible work, that there are, there are jobs, there is work that are a mixture of visible and invisible. 
So many of the things that we talk about, uh, let's say, this is an example I use a lot, um, caring work, whether it's paid for or not paid for, and that's a very interesting point, um, and whether it's a nurse or it's a, a family member, involves a great deal of, if you like, heavy lifting, um, in-touch work, but also a lot of invisible work. And what I am urging is that we concentrate a lot on thinking about the invisible work that more and more people are doing and more and more people want to do. This, this changes the whole conversation around work and job and labor. And so I, we've, we've been very interested in this, this territory through our work on things like universal basic income, mm -hmm. um, the notion that a great deal of um, societally beneficial and crucial work is undertaken on a sort of non-wage basis, as you say, within the home, within the community and so on, but even sort of wider thinking about how we learn um, together and, and create together and um, develop and adapt our, our, our cultures. Um, it's very difficult to have that sort of conversation in a politically meaningful way. It always ends up being quite sort of um, peripheral um, and fringe because we keep on coming back to the the, the, the manageable notion of have you got a job are you paid to do that job and if so you're kind of fine we don't need to worry about you without having the broader um, societal conversation how can we get into that broader uh, conversation in an invitational way that can talk more bro broadly about the valuable work that, that happens across society I think that's a really that's a really interesting point and it, it is true that and this is another reason why I'm trying to get the focus away from jobs onto um, One of the problems is that when we talk about work or we talk about jobs, that we are dependent upon very partial data. And it's mainly data that has an economic purpose. Um, the ONS does what it can, the Office of National Statistics does what it can, its data on employees is very robust. Its data on everybody else is really not robust at all. There's a famous example of the Bank of England several years ago, underestimated the number of volunteers in this country by 50 times. It was 50 times more than they thought it was. And yet these are the people in charge of economic policy. Yeah. Um, so, so we have to back off of conceiving of work as basically an employment business, which is how the economists think of it, and look at it in a different way. And we are moving to a society in which the numbers of people who do a nine to five full time job in one place that they go to in the morning, stay there, come back in the evening to their home is a small minority of all the different kinds of work that we do. And I think this crisis, partly by requiring people to work at home and in other ways, will throw a spotlight on the nature of the work that we do, as opposed to just looking at the job, which is the means by which we get paid. We have to come back looking at the individual, how do we educate them? What do they want to do? What are they good at doing? How do they work with other people? How do we organize them? How do we measure their work? How do we manage their work? And how do we pay their work? Pay is absolutely crucial. And at some point in this discussion, you mentioned UBI, and at some point in this discussion, we have to work out seriously how we can move to a UBI. We're not there yet. Our government is not capable of doing it at the moment. We don't have the data, we don't have the administrative skills. And in a way, we don't have the, the sense of care. If you look at how uh, um, universal credit was, was implemented, that was not done well. And we can't have that system implementing UBI with the same sort of standards. So we have to work out how, as a society, we can 
set up an administration that can implement UBI in a way that everybody sees to be fair. Yeah, it's interesting. We, we're we clearly not there yet. I mean, in fact, we've been working quite uh, diligently over the past week or so to put together a, what in effect was a basic income just for self-employed people at this at this point as an answer to the need to get cash to self-employed yeah. people quickly on, on some fair basis. But the, the government in ultimately went a, a, a different way because of this, this fears of, of rewarding things that aren't paid work. And I want to just come to the, 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 the question um, around how... Um, you know, a conversation around invisible work, knowledge work, creativity, cognition, emotional labour could risk embedding inequalities in society. I just want to get your reflection um, on, on on that. Of course, there is there is a critique of this this way of thinking, and um, the, the sort of new spirit of capitalism critique, Boltansky and Kierpello, who who see all this as a means of creating a new sort of status of creatives um, who are at the top of the you know the modern firm, which is a swarm firm, which is based on teams and is networked and lattice and all those things. And this is actually about sort of having the sort of the spirit of 68 brought into the sort of corporate and work environment. But underneath it all, the, the, the sort of the deep inequalities and power dynamics still take place, not least between genders, um, uh, if, if, if you like. And somebody, you know, the labour that we talked about, the care labour that we talked about, obviously is occupied far more by women the men. How do you respond to that critique and the risk that actually this could um, end up identifying a, a, a sort of a class, a series of occupations, a series of roles that are heavily invested with invisible work and therefore deserve higher status, pay, power, if you like? I think we are, in a way, there already. I think if you look at the um, policies since the 60s to provide education up to university level, tertiary education, we're now in most countries between 40-50% of the school leaving population goes on to university. That's where the inequality starts. And it's, a, it's almost a deliberate policy to educate half the population and not the other half of the population. My response to that is um, twofold. I am, I am unabashed in saying that we should, we should look very carefully at invisible work, we should make people understand it, we should make them better at it, and yes, that will lead to the organisations you've just been talking about. We, as a, as a, as a, uh, as a, as a society, um, not just within the UK, but globally, we face extraordinary problems of, let's say, climate change. That to me is one of the greatest problems we face. We need the brightest, best possible people to address those problems. So I am unabashed in saying, let's get good at invisible work. I'm also completely acknowledging that the inequality that you mentioned is is getting is very high already, and it and is getting worse. I don't have many solutions for this. One I'm absolutely committed to is that we should put much more money into school education as well as university education. I would just stop any increase in university education. I will be attacked for this, I know. I would put lots more money into kindergarten, primary, childcare, secondary education. I think it's really important that we educate people as well as possible from the very beginnings of their lives. And, and we, should, we should support families, we should support children, we should put, support teachers. We, we, should, we should not skew our education system to the glamorous high end of the university. We should put much more money into the initial part of it. And we also should recognize the nature of work is changing. UBI is part of that. That's the package. Otherwise, we will end up with inequality, and that will be intolerable. And it's interesting, isn't it? Um, th there are two words that, for me that kind of define this, this, this inequality in some quite fundamental ways, and it's the words knowledge 
and skills. Right? If you go on that university track, you are going to acquire and develop your knowledge. If you go on the other track, you're given skills which are more, more functional. And almost the whole frame of reference that we have for different types of education in institutions, the university track on one side, and obviously FE skills and, mm. and straight into work, work-based training, are kind of in our, in our minds are kind of separated as two separate domains um, almost. And that, that divide opens up at a fairly um, early, early stage. And almost we need to push back against that, don't we really? Almost yeah. it seems to be what you're yeah. saying is that it – all of what we do is about knowledge. Let's celebrate the, the, the range and variety of that. Let's not devalue the, the subterranean knowledge development that happens uh, across all of our, of our endeavors. Um, and let's not separate us in this way. We all do invisible work. We have capacity for it. We yeah. should identify it. We should develop it. And, but understand that it, it plays out in different ways in different settings. Yes, you're quite right. The, the, the great benefit of going to university, and I went to university, is that you are encouraged to ask questions. Yes, there are skills, you are taught knowledge, you're, you're taught certain skills of analysis, but above all, you have three years when you are encouraged to use your brain, encouraged to use your mind, encouraged to read widely, encouraged to debate, argue, um, work out how to disagree with people, and encourage all the time to take a position on things. You're not simply seen as the recipient of a skill. And that difference is the most important thing. Children, I, I was very lucky I went to a school where I was encouraged to ask questions at an early age, and I was very lucky in that. I think that encouragement to ask questions, which if you like, it's part of the debate about creativity in education. That ability to ask questions and to play and come up with one's own answers is fundamental. And we need to encourage that from a really early age, as soon as we feel it's proper that education should start, uh, and childcare is part of that, then we need to do that. Otherwise, we are going to end up with wider inequality. How do we stop invisible work becoming an individualistic pursuit? Uh, the autonomous, secluded thinker. How do we ensure that it is a social endeavor? And how do we go about creating the mechanisms by which we might do um, invisible work together in a meaningful way that is connected to organizational or wider societal purpose to go back to your early framing in the conversation? I don't see that as a problem because, in my experience, almost everybody now works in teams, works in groups, is very open to talking about their own work. I'm not opposed to someone sitting in a corner and doing whatever they think is really interesting to them and, and, and possibly beneficial to the rest of society. I'm not opposed to that at all. I think we should have more of that. But I think the the people that want to do that, and, and, and certainly for a long time, which means they're quite good at it, are very, very rare. And, and, and we will not, we're in no danger of, of that sort of exploding into sort of anarchy. I think companies now, small companies, big companies, the ways in which companies work with what I call subcontractors, but I mean they freelance people, independent people, self-employed people, partnerships, associates, Work now is a very open, inclusive operation. And I don't see that as a problem. I think we have to learn how, as I say, to articulate our work to others. And I think that's a skill. I think it's a skill that um, can be taught, can be encouraged, can be learned. And we, many people are good at thinking but not very good at articulating what they're thinking. This is to do again with management and leadership. And we have to be very good at articul articulation is of absolutely key quality. If you can articulate what you're thinking and how it not only is interesting to you, but how it helps the person you're talking with or how it helps the team. If you can articulate your idea so the team says, 
That's a really good idea. Let's do it. That's a really important quality for people to have. And I think we have to work out how we can encourage that quality. I'm trying to avoid the word skill here. Provide that quality, again, from a really early age. So to a school in, in Newham in East London, uh, called School 21, and one of the primary things that they value is what they call oracy, which is exactly what you're, what you're describing. And they do it in conversational, discursive um, settings, and they see that as a very powerful educational tool. So we'll have to watch um, how that develops. Um, we're coming to sort of the end of the, the, the conversation now, but I just kind of want to loop back to where we, where, where, where we started, because as we've been having this conversation, I've been reflecting on what I've seen. And you can only respond to your own immediate surroundings, given that everything is so disrupted at this at this moment. But um, when, when I reflect as to how you know we as an organisation have shifted, we, we of course our, our, our sort of spatial hub has been removed from us because we're now physically um, isolating. So we've dispersed. Um, I've I've seen remarkable sort of feats of self management and also new collaborations and collaborative spaces emerging. But also, if I'm honest, an even um, a, an even more sturdy gaze to the outside world and what's what's required of of of, of us. We've got a thirty thousand strong fellowship. There is a policy discussion going on. There is a political discussion. There's a sense making um, space which needs to be sort of contributed to, and so on and so forth. So all those things that you're that you're talking about, I've started to see actually in in a whole variety of different ways. My my big fear in some respects is now what happens when our spatial hub returns do we do we default back to some of our old ways of doing things or this is are we definitely in a new uh, realm now and and um, you might have some thoughts on that but i guess time will tell i think we're in a, it's a new ball game i i originally wanted to write a book about the future of work and i realized that actually it was invisible work that was driving the future of work i think what's happening with with people working at home which is, in a sense, a more personal and also more egalitarian process. Uh, the hierarchy is less visible if everybody is sitting at home. Um, so I think that, will, that, that, that change in mindset will continue. People are asking themselves, what is it that I'm really doing? How, how can I contribute? How can I make a difference? Uh, what what do I find most interesting about what I'm doing, and how can I explain that to other people? It's it's a little bit about what I call collaborative efficiency. You want to collaborate, but you want to do it in an efficient way. So it's collaborative efficiency. You've got to be articulate. You've got to manage relationships. And I think many people will go back to the office after this crisis is over with some quite profound questions about themselves and their place in the organization. And I think that's a really good outcome. I, 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 I really welcome that. Um, so that, in a way, is a short-term process with a bit of a short-term benefit to the individual. Organizations will find it hard to cope with. Long-term, I think there's going to be a change in our attitude to offices. The, where they are, um, where they are located, how they are designed. Companies have often invested over the last few weeks in a lot of complicated technology. People say, well, that's good. Why well, should get on the train? Can't I stay home on Wednesday? Flexible working would increase. It will ask us to question everything about what we call work, what we call a job. And it will bring the future of work all the things you've been talking about during UBI that much quicker. Yes, I think I think that that all is absolutely right. Um, and I wonder as well whether actually in this time that we may be becoming, and I hope it's not just in the short term, slightly less self-centered and introspective in terms of our own work. We're seeing the value of what others can provide in, in, in new ways. A wonderful thing, you know, we're speaking on uh, Friday the 27th here and, and, and last night at eight o'clock, of course, everybody got on our streets and started applauding NHS and care workers um, and so on. And uh, all of that, um, 
infrastructure of societal support and care is suddenly not only visible, but celebrated. And hopefully, as we emerge from the other side of this pandemic, we hold on to that um, and see that how we rely on each other in a deeply interconnected way. I think that's true. I, I alternate between being very pessimistic about the current crisis, and it does show up weaknesses in the way we run our societies and the way government relate to those societies. But I think it's forcing everybody to question what it is that they do, how they relate to their neighbours, who they might in the past not have met very often, and a sense of a bottom-up, sort of grassroots-up community. It's happening here in Norfolk a lot, and I'm very glad it's happening everywhere. Um, that's entirely beneficial, but I think we have to we have to really think um, we have to realize that after this sort of crisis, we can't go back to the past. We can't go back to some normal world that we were living in. It's going to give a shock to the system, to each individual, and to every company. And um, what's this space? I think that's a brilliant note to, to end our conversation on. Um, I, I'm afraid that is all we've got time for. We could have gone on for quite some time longer, actually, in a very wide range. We talked about artificial intelligence. <laughs> no, we didn't get to artificial intelligence, but maybe we'll save that one for, a, for, a, for another day and occasion. There's plenty there as well. Um, thanks for taking time to talk to us about uh, invisible work. Thank you very much indeed. Thank you. Highly recommended, um, and and thank you to everybody who's uh, who, who's watching. Um, John's book um, will be available. I'm sure there's links that accompany this this conversation, so you can click straight through and get yourself uh, a copy. Um, do keep up with the RSA's channels and social media feeds. We've got a vast archive of online content to engage and inspire, as hopefully um, today's conversation has been able to add to. And we've got plenty more during the coming weeks, um, uh, as well as our sort of uh, research and impact uh, work is available through our, through our website. And of course, there's a 30,000 strong network of fellows who are all volunteering, working, striving to make the world a better place in this moment and beyond. Um, thank you again to um, John Hawkins, and thank you all for watching and do take care.